let's get started. So first, um, what we're going to talk about is, um, ooh, my screen did not update. Give me a moment, there we go. So we're gonna be talking about uh, AI, how to secure AI pipelines. So I wanna be really clear. This is not about AI safety, but I do believe in order to achieve AI safety, you need to have a good foundation that you're building on to make sure that you're doing the things that you need to do. So by safety, that's things like, what is the bias in it? Is it, uh, is it causing harm? So while those are important, uh, this particular one is about how to secure AI pipelines. A little bit of history. Um, the way I arrived at some of this was I had a, a couple uh, converging things that I've worked on over the years in order to uh, in, in order to focus on this. Um, one of them is I've done a lot of work in the zero trust space, um, contributed to things like the Cloud Native Security White Paper, helped organizations move towards zero trust. Uh, wrote a book on Spiffy as part of the steering committee for that. I also ended up working uh, with uh, AI in a, in a large, highly regulated environment, uh, architected large AI platforms and projects. Um, so uh, there's, I also have an extensive background in terms of container storage and similar. So I try looking at things from the platform perspective and uh, one of the questions is how do we make sure that we are doing the things that we need to do in order to properly secure the, in, in order to properly secure the systems. So to get started, um, looking at like what an AI supply chain is. And before we answer this, the question is like, what is a supply chain in general? And generally, when you think of a supply chain, you think of like the origin of all the things that you need in order to produce a thing. And all the things that need to happen, whether it's hardware, source code, what data, what parameters you need. Uh, if it's hardware, like where did, where's the hardware source? Did it follow all the right set of processes? So it's like all the stuff that you need to do in order to get to your final deliverable of whatever that deliverable is. So when we're looking at supply chain, uh, there's a lot here. We're gonna focus specifically on the source code, but there needs to be a way to tie into hardware. So you need to look at how do, how do I know that the system I ran is actually a system that was under my control? So, um, which then gets into the question, well, how do we secure everything? Because that's where people's minds tends to wonder when they start looking at all these different things. Um, the answer towards that is you end up prioritizing. And you start by breaking them down to small steps that you can reason about. Uh, you try to work out what steps you want to avoid, which ones you need to guarantee actually happened. Uh, you, and you can think of each step, each of these steps in isolation uh, for a period of time where you secure that in isolation. Uh, and then as you start to secure more and more systems, you start to ask questions around what, how do they interact and how to secure the actual interaction between them. And you just keep repeating this over and over. Again, focusing on the things that are highest priority that you identify and that you reason about. And over time, you end up in a spot that was, of course, not 100% secure, but you end up in a place that is better off than, uh, than where you were in, uh, in the past. So you do this long enough, um, you end up with something that over time you should be able to reasonably defend. So going back to AI pipelines and software supply chains. Uh, so if you think about, uh, we have a lot of work in the software supply chain. We've done, as a community, we have some really amazing work with like uh, in NPM and Python, uh, Ruby and similar, and also within uh, enterprises on how to start to defend our software supply chains. So one really good way to look at this is, well, AI pipelines, um, and let's scope it a little bit. Um, there are some advanced pipelines out there that are things like federated learning where you don't have control of the systems that you're that you're running on they're running on third-party systems on third-party data so for an initial iteration again scope and prioritize uh, those are important but the main one we're going to focus on today is going to be centralized pipeline data is controlled in data is controlled out and how do we how do we deal with that so that starts to look a lot like a CI CD pipeline and you have source code that comes in, you have dependencies, you have PyTorch, you have your data dependencies on how to parse, um, but then you have additional complexities. How do you handle 
large volumes of data coming in or multiple types of data coming in, that it's many of them are, have sensitive information, how do you deal with the privacy concerns and the security concerns that are, that are within it? Uh, especially, and this becomes especially important, we start to look at model inversion attacks where what they do is they try to reproduce parts of the data set based upon the model, just looking at the model itself. Um, there is a really interesting example of this as well where uh, there was a thing called the Netflix Prize where they offered, I think it was a million dollars to uh, come up with better recommendations. And over time, much of the data which had been anonymized and sent out was able to be re-identified by pairing it with social media and other sources. So they're able to identify a significant portion of, of individuals uh, through additional data sets. So we also have to look at it not just from like a model inversion, but what's model inversion? I have a data model that maybe has been, let's say that a model has been leaked. And then we have to, if it were to be leaked and I were, and then we were to add additional data sets to it, does that, do we have further leakage that can occur from, from that? So uh, these become really difficult to to reason about if um, if you're not thinking of, of them like right up front. Um, and so, in terms of uh, model inversion, uh, I'll, I'll just toss this out real quick since we went a little bit on that. Uh, there's a couple things you can do to mathematically, um, to provide a mathematical basis towards defending. One of the big ones is you can look at differential privacy. If your data is differentiable, you can add differential privacy that'll help defend, uh, defend against it. And a really good example of this is when you have someone who's doing a poll and they wanna ask a sensitive question, like they ask, Hey, when was the last time a per like what percentage of people have done like maybe some kind of a hard drug like let me say it's cocaine uh, at what point um, if you ask them as part of a poll very likely they're going to say no in the poll so you can add plausible deniability to the system where you can say here's a coin you go into a private box and you flip and the person would flip the coin they would uh, if it's heads they would flip the coin again and then they would answer yes if it's heads tails if it's no um, if the first coin toss was tails, then then they would flip the coin again, and then they would answer um, they would answer the question. So one of them they're based on the coin toss, the other one is based upon the actual data. So when they come out of the box, and you say, hey, you answered yes to this. You say, yeah, I got the coin toss one. It gives you plausible deniability. You've learned nothing about the individual, but you've gathered some information because you know what the statistical likeliness of that occur. You can then tell. Uh, whether you're able to look at the population statistics and learn something about the population. So there's things like that that are, have mathematical guarantees that if you follow them very carefully, uh, you can get, you can train on large quantities of data but still maintain a level of privacy because of that plausible deniability. There are limits to that, so if you decide to do that, bring in someone who's an expert in it, but that is a, that is a possible path. So now back on, now from that tangent, we'll go back into back into this with the process. So generally, these are about processes. Like how do we how do we secure a system? You have to start with the with the people. You have to start with the humans and how they interact with the system. You want to define what good practices are. You want to define your policies. You want to make sure people are aware of what their responsibilities are, and you want to have a way to validate to attest that they are performing the work that they're doing also realize things are going to go wrong. So you wanna have incidents response plans, you wanna have security audits, you wanna have a plan for when things go wrong so that you can help mitigate the issues and make sure that the people who are impacted are able to get the proper help that they need, especially if it's sensitive, uh, if it's sensitive data. So one way to do this and what we do is in the software supply chain, so if any of you are doing salsa attestation, there is a very good chance that you're using in Toto. And so, one, um, what, what it basically is, is you set up a set of steps and you define those steps ahead of time and you can sign the document that states what those steps are and those steps get applied. So you have like step one, go fetch the, uh, the binary, uh, or rather the source code, the correct get repo. Step two is run this command. Step three, run these tests. Step four, package it, et cetera, et cetera, until you get to your final, uh, into your final output. So you have these, these layouts is what they call them you have metadata that describes how these layouts are actually ran, and you have rules about what artifacts 
can be used as, as, as input and, and output which includes signatures of the data that's coming in, that's, that's, that's coming in when, when available, and of course signatures when they go out so you can validate this is the actual thing that was, that was tested against. So in this scenario, you're creating a layout with what they call functionaries. So those individual steps in the in total world are called functionaries. And you execute those functionaries, you collect and verify the metadata at each step, and this also gives us the ability to push, not only to push uh, left, but also to push towards the right as well, so that on the left we're trying to gather as much information and validate things, and then on the far, on, as we're pushing to the right, that when we go to deploy these things, we can make sure that they follow the process, or at least have, ev have enough evidence to be comfortable to execute something. So as an example, and I apologize for the size of the screen of the, of the image uh, in this scenario, but at the very top you have a download phase. So this is like a, a typical uh, AI, of course they get more complex than this, but the very top you have a, down, uh, a download phase. Uh, the very top, you, when you're downloading the data set, that ends up create, you wanna be able to find some form of way to hash that data set or to validate it. So you create those attestations to say, this is what I downloaded and this is how I verify it. So you provide that information and uh, you pass that information. And some people will say, oh, this is like in the software build material space, so you'll hear people say, oh, this is an AI bomb or a model bomb or similar. Um, I urge you to, Try it as much as possible, ignore all the buzzwords, and instead go back to first principles and ask what am I trying to achieve? I'm trying to make sure that when I downloaded something, that it, I downloaded it from the correct spot. After I downloaded it, that it has not been tampered with, and I want to be able to demonstrate that at a later time so that uh, if, so, if the system were to be, were, were to be uh, breached, that we can demonstrate that it's not been tampered with. Um, so, with that information, or corrupted as well. Not, not everything's a breach, Some, it could also be corruption. So once you have that, uh, model building phase, the center one, you now have data processing that occurs, you may have model training, so you have all this, uh, these steps that occur. The end result of that is you're providing a trained model and you're providing information to audit that trained model, including hashing the model itself. And goes to the deployment phase, it's the same thing. So each functionary, you see what, am I, what are my inputs, what are my outputs, how do I cryptographically verify when possible, and how do I demonstrate what the steps are. So again, the layout defines every step of the path, and if something fails, and then you have a path towards working out why did it fail, so you can go and update your process or determine like, do in, in investigative forensics to work out why it, why it failed if you need to. Uh, so a couple of things in Intoto is that it has adoption primarily in uh, the two biggest ones is uh, Salsa. And if you look at things like NPM, uh, NPM when you do uh, uh, an attestation through a Salsa compliant CI/CD system, um, the most prominent one that most people talk about at the moment is probably GitHub. But there's other CI/CD systems that are prominent that do the same thing. Um, that the it, it generates an attestation, and the most important thing about this is that the CI/CD system is not ran by the developer. It's actually ran by this third party, who they create a document that says this is the commit ID, and this commit ID led to the creation of this piece of software or to this artifact. So that means that you can go look at where the starting point was and start to audit that particular thing from a well-known point. Regardless as to who created it, you, you know, you at least have a starting place, place as, to where to, as to where to start looking. So generally when you're working in the AI ML space, you want to have the same type of thing where the models are being generated not on, I guess you need to have developers who can do work and generate models while they're testing, but when it comes time to run to production, Ideally, especially if it's sensitive data, you want to have that ran through such a through such a system so that you can tell that it's not been tampered with. So, uh, when you think of that, think of like salsa attestations. How can we then move salsa attestations to include information about about data, or how how can we supplement it with additional information so that we're able to to reason about it? So, uh, a couple things on here is we want to handle the inputs and outputs of the data itself. Um, we want to look at the data flow and the model lifecycle itself. Um, the model lifecycle is interesting 
because it's very common to you build a foundational model. And then after you have that foundational model, you may fine tune it. And so you need to know where was that foundational model from and ideally to know where it, where it came from. Um, you also have the ability to, um, ideally you wanna have the ability to tell what the provenance was. And this is particularly important in regulated spaces because in a regulated space, you may have the ability to do a decision. Like let's say it's a, a financial company that deals with insurance and they may have the ability to use certain things to do the underwriting. New law comes out. They say you can no longer use this piece of information because it makes a prediction on something that is a uh, protected class. That means that you can no longer use those particular data sets for any decisions that are related towards that decision as to what they're gonna underwrite and at what cost. Which means that we have to know where did that information, uh, was that information ever trained on? And if so, where are those models so that we can go and retrain a new model that does not include that information and stay in compliance. So when people are talking about like, oh, there's no compliance, there's no security or regulation, or specifically regulations around AI, there absolutely is regulation on data. And there are very real consequences for messing that up. So keep that in mind. Yes, AI is still, we're still working out AI. We're still working out the, the rules around that. But data, we've had data for quite a while now and we have very, we have very good regulations. Of course, there's room to improve them, but there's, but there's very clear directions that CISOs and the data owners uh, tend, to, tend to follow. So, um, one thing as well is when you train a model, if you've not applied things like differential privacy or similar things, uh, ideally if you've trained on sensitive data, part of the provenance and part of the, of the tracking that you wanna have in your pipeline is to make sure that the usage of those models over time has not, uh, is, has not violated the original data set. In other words, if you have sensitive data that you've trained on top of, uh, you can think of the model as being like lossy compression of that information, if, especially if you've overtrained. So if you're undertrained, it may not be, but if you overtrain it, chances are there's, it's learned something fundamental about the individual uh, elements that are in there. So what this indicates is that when you have sensi a sensitive model, you wanna make sure that you're only using that sensitive model in places where it's appropriate and that you're not just sending a model around. You have basically, for, for now, until we work out legal and technical risks in, in a better way, make the assumption that if you're applying a certain set of controls to the data, you should probably, it's probably a good idea to apply those same controls or similar type of control to the models themselves. Um, that doesn't mean you can't use the model, but, it, but you should make sure that who can access it and what kind of queries go to it are, are protected. So I apologize about the, uh, the layout here, but it's, this is the best I could get the system to. In fact, I even got it scrolling was, was a bit of a miracle. Uh, but this is an example of, uh, of an Intoto uh, layout. It includes information about who signed the layout. It includes information about what the steps are. So this one, it's, it's cloning an example project. It's saying what the expected materials come in are, what the expected products are. It's gonna create a, a binary called Go project. It's gonna run test. So you can see that like this particular layout is super simple, but you can think of this as if you're doing um, PyTorch or, or other type of similar things, you have commands that you can run. You have information about the data that can go in, what you're expecting to come out. You're able to capture that information, make sure that, you're, make sure that those things are properly captured so you can, you can reason about them at a later time. So, before we move on, because we've spoken a lot about in Toto attestations and processes and so on, there's one other fly in the ointment that we got to take care of. Um, and what that is, is that many of the data sets and models that we're dealing with are huge. Like we're talking about petabytes worth of data in some scenarios, and we're gonna see more data sets over time that are, that are of this size. So the question then becomes, how do I attest a large data set? So it just some back of the napkin numbers I did before, um, I made the assumption if I could do 10 gigabytes of hashes per second of SHA-256, which is two to three times faster than common hardware you can get, it would take around 27 hours to hash one petabyte worth of data. And so um, when you consider that, and you consider that you have a system that is working in parallel in order to generate these models, 
there is not enough processing speed. Because when you look at SHA, SHA starts at the start. It runs them into as blocks until you get to the very end. And it's a very linear process. Uh, when you hear about people saying, oh, I do like all these super fast hashes, usually those are crypto miners or similar that will do lots of tiny little hashes that are independent of each other. They're not usually talking about, I have a giant data set. How do I, and how do I uh, test the whole thing? So we have to actually look at, uh, at, how to, at how to do that. So one of the other things, projects I've worked on in addition to in Toto, is a project designed specifically to, to handle that. So we'll also go over that right now. So the project is called Terrapin, and I have links to it at the end of the presentation. So I'll, I'll post information on it. I have a spec that I wrote, and I have two reference implementations, one in Go and one in Rust. But the idea is how to use SHA-256, but instead of start to end, how do we set it up so that we're able to hash all of this information? And remember, the purpose of this hash is to come up with a short, small number I can stick into the Intoto attestation or stick in an SBOM, as we saw before. So that's the, that is the purpose of why we're, why we're doing this, is so we can verify that information, but also have an efficient way to do it. So, um, given, uh, so given that, um, what we do, or the way that it's set up, is you have your initial, your initial data set at the very top. And the very first thing it does is it splits that data set into two megabyte chunks. Um, the actual algorithm can be adjusted, but two megabytes. Uh, I mentioned about having storage uh, background. Two megs is a, is a nice compromise to do some of this stuff without knowing deep information about your, uh, about your data set. So we have two meg chunks that get, that get created for the whole data set, and each of those represents an individual, individual chunk. And then what we do is we hash all of them using SHA-256. So to be very clear, um, this is SHA-256. There's one additional change that, uh, that I have. It's, it is still SHA-256, um, but it's, uh, it's using the Gitoid style approach, which the most important part of Gitoid is you see this 11 here. So if you, let's say you wanted to hash hello space world, that's 11 characters. That gets encoded at the very beginning. It gets prepended before the data. So the actual thing that gets hashed is blob space 11 null character and then 11 characters, hello world. So this is super important because in, with this approach, we're gonna be doing a lot of independent little hashes. You saw like the previous one that we, that we had um, in the previous example. So all these little hashes, we wanna make sure we don't ever end up with a short write because if we end up with a short write, the hash, that chunk is gonna be wrong. And then our final hash IDs are gonna be wrong as well, which means we cannot verify the information. So we want the ability to detect a short write. This gives us the ability, that gives us the ability for the implementation to explicitly check that we wrote 11 bytes to the hash function and then perform the hash no more, no less. So, but the short thing here is that it's basically SHA-256 each chunk in independently. And then what we do is we collect all of those into a single file or into a single index, and they're collected in order. So the first one is the first, so it's 32 bytes for SHA-256. No encoding, so no hex, no base64, just straight up bytes. They end up inside of this hash file, and this hash file, the first 32 bytes represents the hash, the, the hash of the first chunk. The second is the hash of the second chunk, et cetera, until the hash of the nth is the nth chunk. So now we have this file. Um, and if we look at the size of this, one petabyte worth of data ends up with 16 gigabytes worth of hashes, uh, all the chunks that have been gathered together in order. And then we can apply this recursively. This 16 gig worth of hashes, if we run the same algorithm again, we get 256 kilobytes. So in other words, this gets broken up into two meg chunks, same algorithm, uh, reduced or combined in the same way. Uh, merged in the same way, we could say. And then that gives us 256 kilobytes, which is under two megs, and then that gives us our final 32-bit hash. So we just keep doing this until we end up with a final 32-bit hash. That hash there, it's okay to hex that one and shove it into your, or, uh, or base64 encode it, and then shove that into your, into your SBOM, sign, sign that particular one. So, um, so that gives us the ability to independently run lots of processes, and, uh, and get something that, that works really fast, but it also gives us the ability to, uh, to pull information and, and validate it very efficiently. So in this scenario, 
um, if you have a target chunk you want to check, you're just checking that tree, out of that tree, you're only checking the ones, like I have my initial signed 250, uh, 32 byte, I'm checking all of the intermediaries until I get to the final one, I can validate that final hash. So what's nice about that is if I had, again, if I have a petabyte worth of data and I want to validate one gigabyte slice of data that's starting at the 500th terabyte, I don't have to validate the whole thing. What I do is I look for what chunks do I need. So I have 500 chunks from 250, so very simple math, very straightforward that we can do here, from 250 to 250 million 499. So 500 chunks I need to pull. Uh, it's roughly 16 kilobytes worth of actual chunks that we're gonna validate. And then my second layer, I then find, well, which, which index was that one? Well, there's only one chunk I needed so I, so it's, um, that I need to validate for that. And the third one is the, is the root hash that, 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 um, that we pull. So those, those are the ones I really need to validate. But in order to do, this, do that, because we have two meg as our, as our alignment size, that means that our minimum that we can pull is two megs. So we have to pull two megs, and then our second layer was 200 v6, because that was the size of the whole index for the, for the middle one. And the last one's 32, uh, 32 bytes. So that means slightly more than two megs in total to validate one gigabyte of data starting at 500 terabytes, as opposed to validating the whole set from start to end, waiting for a couple days and then being able to check. So this gives you the access to validate your information immediately. There's another thing I did not toss in here, but because of this particular structure, it also makes it very easy that if you want to update those data sets and you only need to work out which chunks that you've changed, and uh, validate those particular ones, create the hash all the way back to the top. So it also gives you the ability to do very f efficient updates. But the most, the most important out of this is this, what, this one that I mentioned here, the ability to take arbitrary slices of information and to be able to validate that. Um, future work on this, so I, I have two reference implementations I, as I mentioned. Future work on this is gonna be looking at creating a Fuse plugin working on how to get this stuff integrated with PyTorch so that we can start to have this stuff done uh, quickly and efficiently. Um, so, um, again, to bring it back to the attestation, is that when we download this in the download phase, we wanna have this part here, the, the attestations, we wanna have these to be very fast and very efficient. And by the way, this is also very fast as well because you, you can throw multiple computers at it so it's, it becomes embarrassingly parallel. So this allows you to hash things uh, incredibly fast if you have additional computational power. Um, so, once, so once you have that, then that, that gives us a single 32 byte thing that we're able to then inject into our, into our SBOM and to, in order to, to validate. Um, so if these are things that are of interest to you, uh, or if you wanna, if, if you'd like to help either imp to, to implement these tools or steal ideas from this as well and say implement similar types of hashing, um, please do start thinking about the security of your AI pipelines. Um, here are some references. Um, this one on the very top I included because I actually wrote this document for the US government for NIST uh, along with Santiago um, uh, Torres. Um, and this, this describes uh, how to do software supply chain security for initially for microservices, but the ideas are also applicable in other areas. Uh, links to Intoto, to, to the projects, these are the two um, reference implementations that, uh, that we created. There is a spec, I will link the spec later on um, uh, in order so that people can see it. And since we've gone over that, let me go over one more thing. So, um, just as a quick demo to demonstrate. This is a single system, my current laptop that I have right here. Um, this is actually a SHA-256 implementation that I wrote because the one on Mac OS is super slow. It takes um, about a minute to, this, this random file is actually 16 gigs large. Uh, so if I just do a straight up SHA-256, uh, it takes about 10 seconds. You'll see it pop up in a brief moment. And you can see 9.5 seconds worth of, uh, of total time. And uh, we see the hash, the, the shot, this is like the shot of the six hash uh, without the Terrapin algorithm. Uh, if I run the Terrapin algorithm on the same data set, and um, I call them pins in a scenario that we're pinning data. Um, and let's go ahead and time it. So again, it's hashing every single byte that's on there 
because it ran in parallel, was able to engage more cars. So even on a single system, we've gone from 9.5 seconds to 2.7 seconds. And that is including the, the indexes that were built up on top of it as well. Um, so, uh, so it's much faster even on a single system in order, to, in order to perform this. It's not using any weird hashing algorithms or any non-standard hashing algorithms. It's just a very standard hashing algorithm applied in a very specific way to, to come up with this number. Um, and so, yeah, in short, that's the, um, um, that is the, uh, the project and a quick, uh, quick demo of it. Um, I should mention one last thing before as well. Like this one was showing a petabyte, but imagine this is 16 gigs as before. Uh, because it's so fast, you probably don't even need to store the intermediate, so you can just keep the final 32 bits, and you can still get that as speed advantage of moving from 10 to 3 seconds. So you still have those advantages, even if you don't store intermediates. But these intermediates become very important when you start to, to work at scale with very large quantities of data and very large number of systems that you want to, that you want to test against. So with that, that concludes my, uh, my demonstration. Um, I have a few minutes worth of time left on the clock for questions, and thank you very much for your time. So we have a mic here if anyone would like questions. If not, I'll be, I'll be around as well after as well if, uh, if you would like to ask a question in, in a more private sense. Cool, not seeing anything, so we'll yield the rest of the time and, oh, you got a question. Yeah, sorry, um, just to repeat quickly, you said that the default um, binary for SHA-256 on the Mac took a lot of time. How long would it take for that random file? Uh, how about we run it right now? I actually yeah. wrote a script because they don't have a normal, um, they, they don't use like the SHA-256 command on Linux. Um, so let me show you the command for that. So the command that comes built in is SHA-8 of the 6 to tell it's raw, to tell it's that. Um, and then I, what I will do is I will explain to you why it's slow while it's running. I'll probably finish explaining why it's slow before it finishes. <coughs> so the reason why it's slow is because when you run um, a, in a, a modern system, like you're using OpenSSL or Boring SSL. By the way, this uses the one I wrote uses Boring SSL. It also works with Rust Crypto, uh, so you can that means you can run it in WebAssembly. But Boring SSL has a lot of optimizations in it. There's two things in particular. It does vectorized uh, calculations, so it'll actually shove everything into uh, what into a vector, and then it'll do SIMD. The other thing is when, when uh, SHA intrinsics are available in the CPU, it will also make use of that. So those two things make it a lot faster, which is why it took 50 sec 55 seconds in one was just normal CPU versus accelerated with, uh, with SIMD. So that is the reason why it took that long. Now the reason why it ran a lot faster in the Terrapin one, there we go, 54 seconds. The reason why it ran, ran a lot faster in the Terrapin one is because the Terrapin one was using the, uh, the boring SSL uh, implementation, so it was accelerated. And also, uh, I, was, I was able to engage using, uh, using Tokyo and Futures. I was able to then uh, perform the hashes and engage all of the cores simultaneously, so they were all working simultaneously to perform, uh, to perform the hashes. So that is why we're able to go from from, tenths, from 55 seconds, the initial implementation of Turbin actually took it down to 10 seconds, which was set up with the same as uh, SHA-256, and then when I added in the uh, distribute, the uh, parallel portions of it brought it down to under three seconds. Thank you for the question. Cool, any others or? We... Fantastic, well thank you all for your time.